Guys, it's a sad day in Bitcoin's history. I've been a staunch Bitcoin advocate for over four years now. And, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs came out today and said that um, it's not a good investment. I, I don't know what to do. Um, probably dump my bags, um, maybe move into Ripple. Uh, you know, I've been on the phone with my grief counselor and with my attorney and hold on, wait a second. Weren't, weren't Goldman Sachs the, the, the people that bought the top in 2017 during the Bitcoin rally and then lost their ass on the way down in 2018. And that's why they're negative on Bitcoin. Meanwhile, all the other major financial giants around the world are starting to buy into Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think we might be just fine. Stay tuned guys for breaking Bitcoin. Welcome back to Breaking Bitcoin, ladies and gentlemen. All right, we've got a fantastic show for you. Uh, today is May 28th, 2020. Awesome day. This is your daily source for everything. Cryptocurrency markets and personal finance. I'm your host, Justin Wise, lead analyst at CrackingCryptocurrency.com. Hopefully you guys are doing absolutely fantastic today, wherever you happen to be tuning in from, whether you're watching us on YouTube, Twitch, DLive, Facebook Live, or on Roku with the Investor News Channel app. If this is your first time to the show, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon and be sure to smash the like button. I know we can get to 50 likes before I even read the news. <laughs> All right. Uh, if before we begin, uh, today's show is brought to you by the Kraken Cryptocurrency Premium Trading Group. As always, if you're tired of watching price from the sidelines, trading with your gut, or being disappointed by the latest calls from crypto Twitter, there's never been a better time to join our community of traders and begin building your very own objective data-driven strategy. You can take advantage of our community and one-on-one -on -one mentoring, our premium indicator suite, our verified trading signals, and much more. You can find all the information at premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com or click the link in the description below. That's premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. All right, what a fantastic day. Traditional markets are pumping. Uh, Bitcoin is moving up as well, Sansi says. I mean, what? <laughs> Half a coin puffin. Uh, meanwhile, we'd be trading. Uh, a lot to talk about today. Uh, I pushed, I've uh, been pushing code updates like mad. So for premium members, they're well aware of this. Uh, I finally pushed the Wadatar Explosion massive update. Though I wanted to get pushed, they got pushed actually this morning. Last night, I updated the bottom feeder study. I updated the bottom feeder strategy. Uh, earlier in the week, I made massive upgrades to the Wada Atar Explosion strategy tester. And in our previous community mentoring session, I talked about the optimized uh, PTP strategy creation method, which is going to be put onto the online trading academy that is going live in June. And all of that information and course material will be uploaded to our trading academy. So, uh, we, uh, we, we, we've got, we've got a lot to do. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're working very furiously on finalizing and pushing, uh, the, well, uh, we're, we're reviewing the walk forward results of our, of our strategies and pushing those live for our automated systems. So a lot of work being done around the office, never been an, a more exciting time to trade. In my opinion, uh, the trades are going quite well, enjoying the traditional markets pumping because I am net long on equities. So, uh, you know, as, as I'm, as I, I was driving into the office this morning, I just, you know, my, my phone's kind of going crazy with like, take profit, take profit. Anyways, um, let us get right into the charts because there's so much that I want to talk about in the news that I want to break down this morning. Hopefully you guys are doing fantastic. If you have any questions, make sure to drop them in the live chat. The moderators will direct my attention to them during the course of the show. Let's get going. All right. Uh, so uh, here we are on the live scene. Let's just hop into price action real quick. Bitcoin currently trading. Uh, Bitcoin currently trading at 94.64 on the Bybit chart. We are above the continuation filter. The setup that I'm currently looking for is a reversal baseline bounce to the downside. I am still net short on BTC. Uh, we'll break. Uh, we'll kind of go into more detail here in just a little bit. If we smooth price, to, if we smooth price out with Heikinashi, we are seeing that we are getting an exit signal off of our initial uh, short long. So that is valid if individuals want to take that. However, I will be adding to my position and using the uh, the ultimate validation of the baseline cross. So that's what we're looking for. Um, 
uh, looking at current price action, we want to see price above 98.60 uh, to begin looking at being bullish, to begin looking at that actual momentum long, to switch the trend to the upside as we, that would be a break above the baseline. We have not done that yet. Therefore, we are overall bearish on price action, even with this kind of push to the upside. Uh, ultimately, I would be looking for a close above 10,131 before I take my next swing long. If that were to occur, I'd be targeting 12,000 to 14,000. However, that is not my prognosis right now moving forward. I am looking at this as an opportunity to reshort. So we'll see how that ends up playing out. We're not, you know, we never reached any oversold territories. We're still below massive resistance. There's a lot that we could talk about here moving forward. Uh, this is the Wadatar update that I pushed, as we can see. So I finally pushed this. Let's just look at these input settings real quick. Uh, you can select between your entry strategy. There are four different entry strategies. There are four different exit strategies. We have the false positive filter now. Uh, you can adjust the look back length. I have added in all the new moving average types, all the smoothing types. Uh, you can also select your source. I, of course, have Heikinashi close source in here if you want to calculate based off of Heikinashi close and smooth out your input data. Uh, so a lot of uh, interesting things that you can do. And of course, there's alerts for all of this so if you want to hook this up to your own bot implementation or if you want to hook this up to anything that accepts trading view alerts or signals um we can uh we can do that or you can do that excuse me with this so uh, and then of course this goes hand in hand with the wada tar explosion strategy tester which is live for premium members as well and we went into you know we've talked about that for about five hours because in my opinion it's it's uh we've done a lot of work on it i think it's the most robust strategy tester that i've seen so far on trading view <coughs> at least with everything that we want to do and accomplish. All right, Parallax still bearish, Mink still bearish, Watertar Explosion still bearish as well, as well as the breaking Bitcoin trading system and uh, our initiator. So, or excuse me, and the baseline. Now, interesting to note, we did just have a successful bottom feeder trade. Bottom feeder called for a <coughs> reversal long entry uh, right back here on May 24th. That just uh, completed to take profit around 92, 9300, I believe. So another successful, uh, another successful like, and by the uh, another successful trade for bottom feeder. And by the way, uh, we are actually in the process of automating that now. So very soon the premium members will get automated bottom feeder signals uh, across all the markets that it performs well on, which is most of them actually. All right, let's go in and look at the four hour time frame. Four hour time frame on BTC, we are beginning to see bullish divergence, or excuse me, regular bearish divergence. On the four-hour time frame, we reached a previous high here. We have formed a higher high in price action with so far a lower low on our oscillator as well as the smoothing of our oscillator, the noise line and the minx line. All right, so regular bearish divergence coming in from minx on the four-hour time frame. Uh, let's see our Cybot being quiet on the four-hour time frame as well as the two-hour time frame uh, also. Okay. So not a whole lot there. Uh, now, I do think that we can actually push a little bit higher. Let's zoom in on the 45 minute chart. Uh, ISIS spot did call for a reversal sell here, targeting that 1% movement. We did get that. It is uh, it is just recently signaled again on this candle right here, looking for that 1% movement. So I would expect to see one to 2% pullback at this point in time. However, I do think, I do think that we can push higher. And the reason why is looking at the premium and funding indicator, uh, we are still overall in backwardation with positive funding. We haven't yet seen that massive spike uh, of premium to the upside that would indicate that the market has really gone net long. So I think that that moment is yet to come. I think that'll be the better entry area. However, me, uh, I am simply utilizing, as I've said earlier, utilizing this area. I've already started filling my limit shorts on this way up. They started activating at 9,400. 9,500 was my next fill. I'll continue scaling in as we push up into the kind of red box territory that I've denoted. Uh, and I think ultimately uh, the, the the most kind of critical resistance is going to be that untested point of control at 97.60. It seems like a logical area, uh, seems like a logical area for a retest there. And because, as I said, I think it's going to be on the entering of this level uh, if all all complies. Again, this is just this is just my, my trade setup, my trade thesis, that we will begin to see the market go more net long and we can see that aggressive market longing, which would foretell a, uh, a turnaround. All right. Uh, so overall, things are pretty clear. Things are pretty simple here on BTC. As far as I'm concerned, uh, S&P 500 is pumping quite nicely. So this should help push the price of BTC up. In fact, this might be the thing uh, that uh, that that kind of uncorrelates and could make my trading thesis wrong. So I'm you know fully willing to be wrong on this. This is why I manage my risk. Uh, but if the spy continues to pump, that doesn't bode very well for a BTC short. I will be the first individual to admit that. Uh, CME futures are doing well, looking for that reversal baseline bounce from below, which would actually allow us to move up to about 9820 so again uh we and we can overshoot that with wix so uh, we could see we can see higher prices we can see higher prices all right um 
and Rinko and on uh, Rinko on BTC and Ethereum are both bullish. All right, let's break down and look at the broader markets here. Take a look at crypto bubbles. Obviously, it's a good day. Continues to be good times for altcoins. Celsius, Theta, BitShares, Nexo, Hypercat. Half of these I don't even heard of. Uh, we, you know it's a bull market when Electronium's pumping. Omisa go up another 40%. Uh, Engine Coin, Zilliqua, Matic. I mean, we are having just massive, massive movements. Hive down a little bit. Steam down a little bit. Lend down a little bit. Uh, but overall, very, very bullish still. Block stacks up. Go block stacks. Uh, Algorand, go Algorand. Uh, up 15.2 and 6.2, uh, respectively. Um, oh, I have this on the week, not daily. You're right. Okay, cool. Sorry. Uh, still a pretty good day for all coins. All right. Electronium up 14, ADA. Okay, cool. So it wasn't, wasn't that crazy. I was thinking that that was wrong looking at that, right? I just did my analysis, right? So thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, Theta finally getting that pullback. I did talk about selling that yesterday. Uh, other than that, I don't really see anything too interesting on here. Uh, UBT up 2%. We talked about that one not too long ago. Stack still up. Algorand still up. Electronium, HBAR. Ada, Quant Stamp being the big outliers. NRG, who continue, NRG like continues to just continue airdropping me coins in Discord. I'm not sure, uh, not sure what's up with that. Uh, but good looking out though, I guess, you know, I don't know if like, I don't know if they're like substantial amounts. Whatever. All right, uh, we've got the spy looking well here. Let's actually take this off. I wanted to add the new version of Watatar. You guys can add the uh, the the, the Wada Tar Explosion version. It's one of the most popular indicators on TradingView. Just search for cracking in the indicator widget in the public library. It's this one right here, Wada Tar Explosion. All right. That's a good feeling right now. I got the air conditioner on. I can feel it. I can feel it coming. All right. Uh, let's take a look at Ethereum. Uh, let's go ahead and just look at the derivatives over on Bitstamp. All right. Uh, so Ethereum needs to break 218.20 to continue to consider bullish trades to the upside. So we need about another, really only about another like 2% to the upside here. A nice, uh, nice strong close to the upside might signal this. We smooth price out. Uh, we're almost there as well. Getting the exit signal for shorts today though. So good. So Ethereum overall is neutral for me. I don't want to do anything with uh, Ethereum. All of my indicators are not agreeing here. Uh, so I do need to see that close above 218.55 to be looking for longs on Ethereum. Uh, EOS as well need to see be a, need to see above 265. XRP needs to put in some work. Uh, XRP XRP needs to go up to uh, to uh, above 20 cents, almost 21 cents, 20.9. Uh, you know because I don't really like trading XRP. What I would say. Uh, what I would say though is, if wanted to take a if one wanted to take a speculative bid on XRP here uh, to the long side, kind of trading it as a reversal trade, you know, this close above the continuation filter could set you up for about a three to four percent trade uh, for reversion to the mean on the baseline. That would be valid uh, if you are looking for that type of trade. Again, nothing significantly oversold here, um, and no, yeah, I mean, you know, Type C, uh, Type C bullish divergence where we have uh, where we have an equal low. Uh, excuse me, where we have an equal close, right? Remember that uh, this indicator, Minx is calculated off close, not lows. Uh, so we have equal lows here uh, when we're just looking at closing price, and we do have a higher low on the oscillator. So that's that's the weakest type of bullish divergence that you can have. Uh, but again, it'll move with the rest of the market. But remember that XRP has this bad habit of not moving as strongly with, with the rest of the market. It's just one of the weakest pairs that you can trade, honestly. Uh, and that's not my personal opinion. That's just that's that, that's just fact. It it, it moves weakly. Uh, in correlation with the other dollar pairs. Um, let's see here. Uh, BNB BTC has recently given an exit signal for long. Same with TRX. A lot of our Bitcoin pairs are pulling back. F Bitcoin. Uh, USDT pairs are moving to the upside. BNB need to see above 1709. Um, let's see here. Yeah, EOS Bitcoin pulling back. Finally, Link BTC pulling back. Link USDT looking for a reversion to the mean. ONT pulling back. Uh, ADA outperforming to the upside, an outlier certainly today. Uh, Ethereum Classic, Litecoin, all giving us pullbacks on the BTC pairs. Um, we'll take a look at a few more of these by request. Um, all right. 
Let's take a look at uh, Forex today. The Aussie Yen performing well. This was qualifying for a long, uh, roughly about a week ago, and one could still be holding on to that position currently. Nothing to do at the moment. Uh, the Aussie Kiwi shorts are still valid and validated above 1.07317. Nothing to do currently at the moment. Uh, the Aussie CAD is in a no, uh, do nothing position. One can hold their longs on the Aussie dollar as well as the Canadian Swissy. I'm still long on the Canadian yen. Swissy yen is valid. One can still hold longs, but no entry today. The Euro Aussie is in a do nothing situation. I need to see price close above 167.013. Uh, the Euro Canadian might be a potential. No, Parallax does not agree there. So the Euro CAD is in a do-nothing situation. Uh, the Euro Swissy, it's valid to hold longs. Uh, the Euro Kiwi, it's valid to hold shorts. The Euro Pound uh, might be looking at invalidation. I attempted to take this for a reversal. We're pushing back up into resistance, so we'll give this a couple days to see how it plays out. Uh, the Euro Yen, one can continue to hold longs, as well as the Euro Dollar on that breakout position. One can continue to hold shorts on the Pound Kiwi and the Pound CAD. The pound Swissy is in a do-nothing situation. The pound yen is beginning to look valid for longs. We'll take a closer look at that one today, actually. Uh, as well as the pound dollar. Uh, but not the pound Aussie. Shorts are still valid on the pound Aussie. Kiwi dollar longs are still valid. I'm still long on the Kiwi dollar. Um, as well as the Kiwi CAD. And we'll take a closer look at that one here in a little bit. Kiwi Swissy, one can continue to hold longs, as well as the Kiwi Yen. The Dollar Canadian, I'm still holding my short. Uh, the Dollar Swissy, probably should have been short on this, but I can see why I didn't. Shorts are still valid. Uh, the Dollar Yen is in a do-nothing situation. Recently got the exit signal for the long. The Aussie Swissy is beginning to look like a potential long here. And let's look at the Dollar... Uen. I'm still long in the Dollar Uen. Getting a pullback today after hitting our first take profit, so we will... But there's really nothing to do here for the dollar win. All right, cool. Looking at our major indices today. So definitely some action to take. Definitely some action to take uh, in Forex today. Maybe a couple trades. Um, overall, I think things are still trending well. Uh, uh, looking at the Dow, uh, nice gap to the upside. You know, three consecutive gaps to the upside today on the Dow. Or at least looking at the DIA, which I would trade. Um Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing really to report on the Dow today. Things are looking well. Um, let's look at our cues. Sorry, uh, look at our cues. Uh, Nasdaq, you know, interestingly enough, Nasdaq getting close to a near all-time high on the Nasdaq Composite. I mean, just a complete retrace right back up to those highs. Uh, and potentially, let's take a look, smooth this out a little bit. So I want to get a good. Yeah, not quite yet if we smooth price out, uh, but if you wanted to be a little bit riskier, we are looking for a potential long follow along today. I would be a little wary about taking the Nasdaq long. Uh, at near all-time highs, especially because the uh, the SPY and the Dow just look so much better. And in fact, I don't have speculation on the Dow. I'm just trading the SPY. I'm actually trading the SPLG because that's what I prefer trading. Uh, and I've been long in the SPLG for a few days now. Uh, just hit my first take profit on the SPLG, actually. Um, that's about it uh, for traditional markets. We can look at commodities or other pairs by request. Uh, let's get into uh, let's get into uh, kind of the, the the news of today, just kind of the brief snippets before we get into... Uh, the cryptocurrency segment. All right. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Goldman Sachs a little bit later in the show. And, you know, just kind of the first thing that I want to mention is kind of the contrary information coming out from JP Morgan. So JP Morgan analyst, uh, Nick, I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name. Uh, he's, uh, he's done a new uh, flows and liquidity report in an attempt to calculate uh, that Bitcoin do or to, to, to attempt to calculate Bitcoin's intrinsic value. Right. Uh, the approach taken, you know, he took this approach to estimate a quantifiable intrinsic value for Bitcoin and that this would be an effective way to treat it. You know, so it, he by treating Bitcoin as a commodity and basing its intrinsic value on the marginal cost of production, which a lot of individuals have already been doing, uh, he was able to calculate that Bitcoin does actually trade at an intrinsic value, right? So long story short, the market price and JP Morgan's updated estimate of the intrinsic value of Bitcoin uh, reflects uh, reflects that it does trade at or above its intrinsic value. It can trade below its intrinsic value, and therefore it is not absolutely worthless, contrary to what Goldman Sachs wants to say. We'll get into that here in just a little bit. All right, uh, Coinbase announced it's going to be acquiring the crypto-focused brokerage Tagomi. 
Uh, this acquisition is going to really help round out Coinbase's institutional market offerings. They've been doing a lot of acquisitions in this realm. Retail investors have obviously complained regarding uh, uh, the company's fee structure through the app, but they are kind of targeting uh, the institutional investors, which I will make the argument is not a bad thing. I've made this argument many times. How do you bootstrap the Bitcoin network to make it better for retail individuals to use? You need to get a lot, a lot, a lot of liquidity in there. And who has a lot of liquidity? Well, institutional investors do. Uh, Samsung doubling down on uh, on Bitcoin and crypto. Gemini Exchange integration revealed. Uh, so uh, uh, Samsung's blockchain wallet is going to be adding support for users of the uh, for 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 users of the Bitcoin crypto exchange Gemini in North America. So this is pretty cool. Right on your phone. Uh, Mike Novogratz, not the only individual uh, that is concerned about the Chinese DCEP, Digital Currency Electronic Payment System, the uh, CBDC. Mike Novogratz, petrified of China's new state-issued cryptocurrency, and Joseph Lubin agrees, as they should. Uh, we're not the only, you know, unfortunately, we're one of the few channels out there that consistently talk about the dangers of CBDCs and why actually corporate offerings are more attractive alternatives because of the way that the free market works, but most people don't understand that. It's okay. Um... You know, we touched on this, so we'll be touching on this more moving forward. There's already a lot of information out there about this. I think we actually covered this the day it came out, but obviously Russia proposing law. This has not been voted into legislation yet, but Russia proposing laws to essentially ban cryptocurrency in Russia, right? Uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of false information on this out there right now. And this is, of course, a contentious issue. Uh, but this this basically would criminalize the usage of cryptocurrency. Like if you hold cryptocurrency, uh, it's not like you go to jail, uh, but you would be basically um, disallowed from from um, launching a cryptocurrency or transacting in cryptocurrency or paying for goods and uh, uh, goods and services with cryptocurrency or launching a cryptocurrency business. Um, and yeah, so these are these are fairly punitive laws. Uh, here's the thing, though, like, again, this hasn't been voted into law and governments, banks, institutions, they do this all the time. They float legislation uh, to kind of gauge what the reaction is. So. So I would be um, a little tentative about this. This hasn't been voted into law, and so we don't have really any conclusive evidence. I just want to say that there's a lot of bad information out there on this right now, a lot of fear, FUD, uh, and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like anti-Bitcoin individuals like saying, aha, this is the thing. We've been waiting for this all along. This is why you should use BSV. How does that even make sense? I don't understand. Uh, but uh, we will update this a little bit more. Our favorite shitcoin, BCH, um, <laughs> uh, apparently... Uh, apparently, after a contentious fork off of the Bitcoin main chain and a so far failed project, uh, it seems like uh, BCH, which, you know, is basically a development community uh, and um, uh, and user base of like contentious individuals anyways who like conspiracy theories. Um, uh, apparently, there's a rift within the uh, Bitcoin Cash community. So Roger Ver says Bitcoin Cash developers are behaving like Bitcoin maximalists. It's almost like if you're an intelligent developer that you you begin developing like maximalist type mindsets. Uh, he says that if BCH devs insist on a 32 megabyte block size cap, then he will exit the chain. Right. We got to make the blocks bigger. Got to make the blocks bigger so we can centralize the mining more. And. Um, uh, and yeah, and so it's cheaper because lightning is too cheap. Uh, end users do not care about decentralization and censorship resistant payment channels. Generally, because those people are using Bitcoin. All right, moving right along. So uh, look forward to a, another uh, another BCH fork, and uh, if you if you hold some BCH, maybe a maybe a crypto dividend. But BCH is not worth too much anymore nowadays. So, um, all right. So let's get into our crypto currently segment. We've got a lot uh, to talk about today in our crypto currently segment. So if you guys have any comments or chart requests, make sure to drop them in the chat. Well, let's get cracking. All right, so uh, American banking giant uh, Goldman Sachs, American uh, banking giant Goldman Sachs hosted a conference call with its major clients yesterday, and those details of that call have since been leaked via Carrier Pigeon. Uh, and this Carrier Pigeon revealed how the analysts at the um, what they call the Investment Strategy Group, the ISG, how how they're basically the analysts at Goldman Sachs think very poorly of Bitcoin as an asset class, right? And over the course of yesterday's conference, investors were presented with reasons why the investment bank does not recommend Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general as an addition to their clients' investment portfolios. 
This is the actual copy right here. Uh, so by looking at the slides that were utilized by Goldman during this presentation, we can see that this was the summary of the argument against investing in Bitcoin generally, right? So uh, one, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin are not an asset class for what they say the following five reasons. One, they do not generate cash flow like bonds. They do not generate any earnings through exposure to global economic growth. They do not provide consistent diversification benefits because they are unstable in their correlations. They do not dampen volatility because they the asset class as a whole maintains a historical volatility level of 76%. So again, they're basically arguing that this does not uh, this doesn't even make sense as a hedge to reduce the volatility of your portfolio. And so far the asset class has not shown evidence of hedging against inflation, which of course is one 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 what one would argue is one of the uh, maybe institutional arguments about investing in Bitcoin. And that although individual cryptocurrencies may have limited supplies, obviously Bitcoin's 21 million BTC cap, their, their contention is that cryptocurrencies are not really scarce themselves because thousands of different crypto assets have been created since 2008. And then, of course, cryptocurrencies have been used for illicit activities. Uh, it is possible to lose cryptocurrency by losing your private keys or if a centralized exchange that you're utilizing, I'm looking at you hit BTC, gets hacked. Um, and their contention that the U.S. dollar will not be debased so that the core fundamental argument of those who are uh, saying that Bitcoin is going to replace or that the dollar is going to be debased, therefore Bitcoin is a good hedge, is silly, right? It was for these reasons, therefore, that led Goldman to come to their kind of penultimate conclusions, right? Uh, that they, you know, that that they do not recommend Bitcoin uh, as a on a strategic or tactical basis for clients' portfolios, even though its volatility might lend itself to momentum-oriented traders. Uh, let me break that down uh, so so that we can so so that you guys maybe you guys aren't familiar with. With, with this kind of speak. They're basically saying, this is not a good investment. This doesn't have the historicity or the good investment profile of stocks. This is not something that we'd recommend for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years as a part of your portfolio, something that you would buy and hold and feel secure in. However, if you were a trader, man, this thing can make you money. Momentum-oriented trader. In fact, here, here's the thing. If you guys will recall, back in 2017, Goldman got pretty gosh darn bullish about Bitcoin, even hired themselves a cryptocurrency full-time trader for their trading desk. And then, of course, they ended up buying the top 2017, lost their ass on the way down in 2018. Maybe that's why they have such a negative opinion. Uh, now, overall, Twitter, uh, naturally, many of, the most, many of the most vocal commentators on crypto Twitter uh, were not impressed when learning about Goldman's presentation to investors or the arguments that they utilized, and they quickly fired back. And we're going to look at some of the best comments that I found this morning calling out Goldman Sachs. So the first thing we have here is Cameron Winklevoss. He says, hey, Goldman Sachs 2014 just called and asked for their talking points back. Bitcoin was declared a commodity by the CFTC in 2015 in the coin flip order. So yeah, it's an asset whose price is set by supply and demand, just like gold, just like oil. It's a commodity, bro. Don't sue me. Uh, uh, you know, uh, let's see. That was, uh, that was Cameron uh, looking at his brother Tyler. He says, crypto used to be where you ended up. Crypto used to be where you ended up when you couldn't make it on Wall Street. The quality of Goldman Sachs' recent research on Bitcoin demonstrates that there has been a talent flippening. Today, Wall Street is where you end up when you can't make it in crypto. Uh, let's see here. What's uh, Goldman Sachs employees may want to attend this. This is a link to... Uh, oh, apparently this tweet is from an account that I muted. Oh, why did I mute Gemini? Oh, because they spam me all the time. Um... Yeah, Bitcoin is okay. So this is a webinar. Uh, that's pretty funny. All right. Um, there's another one from Tyler Goldman Sachs in 2019, 2.8 billion in Bitcoin was sent to currency exchanges from criminal entities. Fun fact: Goldman Sachs facilitated six billion in money laundering via one MDB scandal between 2012 and 2013. Double standard, much sick burn. Uh, Ivan on tech saying hotels hate Airbnb, taxi drivers hate Uber, Nokia hates Apple, banks hate Bitcoin, losers hate winners. Uh, Barry Silbert saying Bitcoin market cap greater than Goldman Sachs market cap. Uh, Adam Back says uh, Goldman Sachs aren't the smart money for a few more years. They don't get Bitcoin digital scarcity, sensor resistant asset class with GBDC buying out two thirds of the block reward too early for followers. Good time for Bitcoiners to stack sats, accumulate BTC positions. And Dan 
I can't, I, know, I can't never remember if his name is Tapiro or Tapiero, but Goldman Sachs does not make fees when a client buys Bitcoin. Buying BTC is an implicit rejection of buying assets that Goldman Sachs sells upon which they make fees. Buying Bitcoin is a rejection of the worldview they sell upon which they make fees. Long, uh, long PTJ, short Goldman Sachs every single time. Bitburn. Bitburn. Now, while asset, while outfits like Goldman Sachs are remaining sour on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, other institutional players has of co have, of course, recognized the trend and are hopping aboard. J.P. Morgan, who are, a, you know, who, to be honest, are former Bitcoin critics themselves, appear to be softening up to the crypto industry. This recent announcement that they will be banking partners for exchanges Coinbase and Gemini suggesting that at least J.P. Morgan's traditional banking operations are certainly open to the idea of forging long-term relationships within the cryptocurrency industry in order to better support a new asset class that, according to some, isn't an asset class, again, according to uh, Goldman Sachs. Another institutional-sized uh, player that's bullish on Bitcoin, of course, is Grayscale, right? They've been making news all week, as it is apparently on a major buying spree of crypto, supposedly buying up all of the Bitcoin mined and then some since the halving event that just took place at the beginning of May. So Goldman's attack on crypto might have been one launched out of bitterness, and it may in fact bring with it a silver lining for the Bitcoin community in other ways that we might not perceive. For one thing... The leading cryptocurrency just received exposure to some of the wealthiest individuals in the world. Of course, this making massive headlines. These high net worth clients rely on insight from the likes of Goldman Sachs uh, and it's and their paid analysts. But ultimately, they are responsible for making their own decisions on where to put their money. And this may end up being one bit of financial advice that they happen to ignore. And it seems that they have ignored you know, many of these prominent individuals may not have considered Bitcoin's value proposition as a monetary hedge until their conference call this week. And they may have spurred the and, and, and they may have spurred the interest that we'll see them doing some of their own extended research, possibly leading to a better understanding, hopefully leading to a better understanding of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in general, or maybe even a call to another fund manager who knows what the hell they're talking about. Right. So new arrivals to our space. These are new arrivals to our space, flush with cash, looking to diversify, may now be learning of Bitcoin's hard capped supply, the monetary hardening, and even of coming to find out about the recent halving that just cut its uh, inflation rate in half again. So considering the popular phrase, there's no such thing as bad publicity, this I think is a case where it applies as true to Bitcoin as well. All right. So while Bitcoin's initial use case was mostly limited, we could argue, to speculation and buying narcotics on the dark web. The underlying technology has held so much promise since it's matured over the years. And now it is, I mean, it's becoming a respected financial asset, right? It's not, uh, it is not living up. It is not uh, anymore like what people used to think it was back in the day, right? And it's a testament to how far Bitcoin has come, right? It's the focal point in a conversation with prominent investors and Goldman Sachs bankers where just 10 years ago, the world didn't even know what Bitcoin was, right? Okay, so this is like a huge slide. Think about that. This is a huge slide that GS prepared, right? So even though Goldman Sachs is seeking to discourage investors from buying into Bitcoin with all of the recent kind of hedge against inflation talk in the end, they seem to have only further cemented the asset class as something to pay extremely close attention to. And again, losers hate winners. Let me know your guys' thoughts in the comment section down below. Let's get back to the charts and let's bring on um, let's bring on the rest of the guys uh, and see uh, see what we're looking at today as we continue to see Bitcoin slide a little bit here on the lower time frames. Give me one moment uh, to get everything set up.
gone, I'm latching on. I don't even know your name, but you're still in my head. Underneath rays of gold, your body oh so close. No, I can't forget, no. When I saw you on the dance floor, or was it you who saw me first? I guess it's history now, and I shouldn't care, but it still hurts. I didn't realize the thing. All right, you guys are live. Phenomenal. What up, crypto or crypto YouTube? What up? <laughs> What's going on, everyone? All right, let's see here. Let's see how we're doing today. Uh, I see challenged investor just left a comment. Uh, actually, are we are we live on the stream? Yeah, yeah, we're live on. The, you guys are live on the stream. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, challenged investor just dropped a comment. I don't know if this is true, but Goldman Sachs is in conversation with Grayscale to buy him out. That would be that would be epic. Goldman Sachs, you know, um, raining hell down on, on Bitcoin with this report, while at the same time secretly buying out Grayscale. That'd be something. I don't know if there's any truth to that, but uh, you know, Mr. Challenge Investor, we're gonna have to follow up on that story. Wouldn't be surprised. I mean. Man. Goldman Sachs is definitely not concerned about looking out for the best interests of their customers. They've shown that repeatedly. It's just funny nowadays that they don't even have to wait a day. Can I turn yourself up, Jason? Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Mm hmm I just think it's funny that like nowadays you don't even have to wait a day to just blatantly contradict yourself. If that's true. Yeah. Well, welcome to uh... right. Well, twenty two. The year of the rat, baby. Yep. <laughs> Our post-truth era. Yeah, yeah. That, would that surprise me? Let's, uh, let's, I'll tweet at them, ask them if they're in private conversations with uh, a troll. I'll troll on Goldman Sachs today. I'm sure they'll be. You know, to... since you have the chart uh, loaded up, um, it's looking like we're going to see a pullback to probably around 9350, 9300. We'll get a retest of that area. I mean, up, up, up just a little bit on the VPR right there. You can see the down right there, there, right there. That spot right there. Mm -hmm. That's where that's where I like that little order block right there for a pullback. Um, you know, accumulate a little bit in that spot and then um, another leg up I into the 9600s where you've got those short orders sitting mm -hmm. and then uh, hopefully pull back. Or at least that's kind of what we're expecting. Yeah. Or... Yeah, and you know, ISIS spot would seem to be suggesting that, looking for about a two. Well, ISIS spot's usually good for a one to two percent pullback, and mm. so that would be about two and a half percent down to that HVN retest of the point of control. Um, I would be a, a little concerned about that. I I would have liked to see. Well, I said ninety three fifty. I I don't think we're pulling back all the way to that point of control right there. Okay. 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 He's going pretty relatively low there. Oh, okay. Sorry. I think I have yours at like 92.27. Yeah. And, and you can see, like, if you zoom in on the VPSV right there, there's a... Uh, inefficiency? Like, there's a small order block, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's an inefficiency right at 9,300. Yeah, I could. I, I would be okay with that. That would yeah, be less concerning. Then, if, we were traced, if we were traced this whole latest pump up, I would consider that a failure. Yeah, and then that would be a nice retest of resistance turned support. I would agree with your first statement in that I, I think that we will break uh, break down here to that uh, 9300 range somewhere in there. I mean, it could wick down even like 9250, but I, I think we got another leg up on this. Yeah. Okay. I guess we're all in agreement. We see another leg up. And I'll be interested to see if the FOMO kicks in at that point to where like we wick up into the 10,000s or anything like that. I'm really curious to see if that happens. Well, that would be, I think, a good sign, a, a good sign for our short thesis if we did see wiki behavior. Yeah, exactly. Like, and that's kind of where I'm hoping to get filled as well. But like, I'm selling my uh, long position from 97.45 at 9700 here. Um, I'm going to be watching it just in case because now I'm going to start just putting on a trailing stop. Man, the four hour baseline killed it here. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, that's perfect. There was a four hour CME gap that got filled because, you know, they just magically do that. It was uh, 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 Bitcoin Daily, or uh, yeah, Bitcoin Daily that, uh, that pointed that out to me. Oh, yeah, that, that gap. Man, I was looking at that. I didn't even see that yesterday. 
Well, that would have been. Yeah, I still didn't see that guy. Uh, somebody was asking for ICX. That would have been Magnus Soderberg. Come on down. Ooh, we're getting pretty wiki behavior at resistance. You know what that means. Long it. Wiki wow. Wiki wow. Let's see here. Um, let's let's do this. Let's look at ICX BTC over here. Let's do something everybody can enjoy. Like, hey, I have a like question. The offspring. Uh, while we're uh, while while we're going through this, what is up with the kiwi? Like, why has it just been on a rampage for the past couple weeks? Because I understand, uh, like, that the Aussie dollar, you know, people have been very bu uh, bullish about Australia's economy mm -hmm. because you know they didn't have all the COVID cases. Uh, you know, they haven't uh, they haven't done all of the money printing that a lot of the other countries have been doing, but. Is the New Zealand just getting like a knockoff effect of what's going on with the Australian dollar, or is there something up else like more fundamental with the Kiwi? I honestly don't know. Not as far as I'm aware. Okay. It's Sorry, I, was just, I mean, it's something I've noticed, uh, you know, while we've been, you know, over the past couple of weeks, I've just been really curious about that. Kiwi's been bullish for the last week or so. I think, you know, overall, I think that they're, I think that they're just having a, a better approach to the lockdown you know like for example the cdc just you know published some new stats yesterday they're pretty promising on the the mortality rate of, of the coronavirus and you know you've got even states like new york talking about coming off of lockdown or starting a scale uh coming off of quarantine uh by the middle of june so just in a couple of weeks uh, but i mean what does that have to do with new zealand well, so while that is, while that would be a case for why is the stock market up? Well, because things are looking yeah. pretty good with the coronavirus and things were already looking good in Australia and New Zealand relative to, or, you know, uh, relative to other countries as well. Okay. Let me have prognosis. Okay. I, um, all right. So I guess, I guess, yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't do to ask too much. Like, why is something happening? If it's not like clearly obvious, then okay, we'll come out. I don't think it's got anything to do with it, but I heard a lot of talk about, um, um, the elites all, uh, bugging out to their underground New Zealand bunker. So I, I also heard similar conspiratorial things. Yeah. There's apparently a lot of bunkers in New Zealand. So you know the, uh, so the local the local luxury economy is booming in New Zealand. A lot of you know a lot of lot of DoorDash orders going on for old yeah. for old fashions and champagne. 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 I can't find the door to this bunker. How am I going to deliver this pizza? <laughs> I'm going in. Um. So, uh, uh, Magnus, uh, in my, if we look at kind of classical technical analysis, it does seem like uh, Icon is at resistance here. Um, it really... What? I said, I'm agreeing with you. I said, yeah. Oh, thanks, guys. I appreciate the support. Mm -hmm. um, you got it, buddy. Uh, it. You know, we haven't really seen a very swift rejection yet. Generally, when we get up to this kind of... Uh, uh, when we get up to this kind of trend line, uh, we tend to uh, we tend to chunk down from here pretty pretty good uh if the market continues to run it's likely to run this is a logical area in my opinion to take some profits uh and if you kind of see a break above i would go with the horizontal level of just call it four thousand sats that seems to be i like if i'm looking at supporting resistance i'm always going to favor uh horizontal over diagonal i've made the case that i'm not sure that uh, horizontal is quite a thing this is at 43.55 you could maybe front run this a little bit that would look like a clear breakout to me um so yeah, just, you know, I think this zone is probably your profit taking, like price is fairly oversold zone. So you wouldn't be a dummy to take some profit anywhere in between here. I think that you'd be probably well served by looking at this area down here to accumulate as, as price has been. And if we end up getting a nice breakout on high momentum, then you can look to take a continuation trade. Um, but overall, Icon looks to be entering or in a profit taking area. Uh, and let's see here. Minx would tend to suggest as well. We're a little overbought on Minx with a little bit of bullish divergence, as we can see here. Higher high in price, lower high on the oscillator, and getting a little bit of a pullback. 
uh, Minx would call, or excuse me, the breaking Bitcoin system would call for an exit if we close below 35.87. So again, uh, nice high price near horizontal and diagonal resistance, overbought indications. Wouldn't be dumb to take some profit here. You don't got to sell everything, but again, I don't think you would be silly. Um, I don't think you would be silly by taking advantage of this area. Never mistake taking profit for a bad thing. There you go. There'll always be another trade. Don't feel like you're missing out. If you've already had a great trade, lock it in, baby. Put that stop loss to break even. You were uh, you were right on that long, Alex. I know. I wasn't going to bring it up. You weren't going to bring it up? Yeah. Uh, don't worry. I'll bring it up. I know. You know, it just kind of made sense. So I thought, figured, hey, you know, we had the short order set up in the 9600 area because, you know, that's what we think we're, we're headed to. So you know, why not take a scalp long? It's exactly why I pulled my take profit on the bottom feeder and I've let it ride since 90, 92, 11, I believe it was. I love bottom feeder so much. Bottom feeder is great. You know, and, you know, it's funny because I was just talking with Justin about this last night. And, you know, bottom feeder was one of the first strategies that, that we developed. Uh, um, and we could not make it with today's, like, much more stringent, like, the, the you know, the way we make the strategies. You know, we've got yeah. all these rules for how it's well, done. It's bottom feeder couldn't simple. be made with the current system. Yeah, I don't with think the current it could either. Because, yeah, I, I've thought about that as well in, in testing it. I'm like, man, there's only a few variables that you need to change here. Like, now when we get into it, it's just like, man, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But uh, me and Justin were talking about that yesterday. It's like, wow, like this is the first one we like got put out. Why aren't we automating this? <laughs> you know, I, there's got to be some kind of beginner's luck involved in this because bottom, it, it's one of those things, it shouldn't work, but damn it, it, it does. It, it's so I, beautiful. I'm making money. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't even just work on the daily. It works on other time frames. It works on things it wasn't, you know, it wasn't originally designed for. It's it's a solid, um, solid indicator strategy. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite I mean, nice. it, it's, yeah. and I, I think that's the important thing because we all realize that this is not your trading strategy, but it is something great supplementary, supplementary that you can add to your trading strategy that helps out and it just so happens that bottom feeder does really well at catching reverse mm -hmm. it's really good if it's really good uh in combination with um with a head short as well because it kind of lets you know when to start putting on long exposure to the point where if you get enough bottom feeder signals you end up flipping kind of your net exposure to, to more long than short. And so you're able to play the best of both worlds. You now, the, the worst thing that can ever happen is that, you know, you're you're really net one position and the market really turns another direction and hits you hard. Yeah, after like an accumulation of signals. But I mean, that's trading, man. The whole thing that we're doing here is trying to mitigate those times. And with this, it seems to happen to our favor more often than not. Mm -hmm. and that's all we can really do right what uh do you guys have any opinions on any of the stuff we covered the first thing we covered was um oh hold on, let's see what survival file is telling me what i need to do to stay alive still aggressive I super could rats have never sent you that website i just wanted a ticker that's all i wanted we, we got a, ticker. a third of americans now show signs of clinical anxiety or depression get outside and get some more sunlight yeah. all right let's see here Preparing for what comes next. What does Survival File think comes next? Uh, we already got <laughs> Super Rats, right? <laughs> the birth of Splinter. While it's impossible to guess precisely what comes next, I mean, were you really expecting aliens and murder hornets? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, that's it. Uh... They're like a mm. see more. Yeah, maybe this is it. I was expecting much. I was expecting more fear. <laughs> My fear has not been mongered this morning. My fear has not been mongered. So the first thing we covered was JP Morgan is finding the Bitcoin trades at an intrinsic value. Um, any thoughts? Um, 
Jack. This, uh, this, not this, not, this, not this, a particular. Oh, sorry, Alex, go on. No, you go ahead. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, nothing in, you know, nothing too new in particular. I think anybody who's been in the space for a while, I think, finds that, uh, you know, Bitcoin at least has got that production cost associated with it. So this idea that it's just, uh, you know, generated out of thin air and distributed is, uh, you know, maybe not news to, to most of us. But, you know, on a day like this where the Goldman Sachs report drops and, uh, you know, rains all over the Bitcoin parade, uh, you know, we need little little offset coming from another big bank. And I guess that's what the, the JPM story was. The the big zero hedge article today juxtaposed the two together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with you completely. This is just, you know, if, if you... Um... If you're not, if you're new to the space, maybe it's cool to be like, oh, this thing has intrinsic value, but you would want to, it's, it's stuff that people have been in Bitcoin for a long time know anyways. It's just like clearly obvious. There's a cost to produce, there's a cost to secure, and that is what gives Bitcoin its underlying intrinsic value, you could argue. But it's also very similar to fiat, right? It's the, it's the value, it's, it's based on the security and the faith in the network, right? Everything kind of comes down to... To, to human faith because you can look at the cash flow or the intrinsic value of a stock but then if the ceo of a company comes out and says yeah you know um uh, i'm actually uh you know a russian plant and an agent and you know like J you know jfk was an inside job then you know it's possible that the the stock of the company could collapse and all the faith in the company evaporates and the stock goes to zero so uh it's um at the end of the day, like all the all the, these maths are nice, but uh, um, at the end of the day, the word value is associated with human belief. So, I mean, and plus, there's there's really no such thing as intrinsic value because all value is is related to human belief. So right. in that sense, yeah. absolutely uh, subjective. Absolutely. This is where we yeah. can get into a more philosophical debate on what that even means. Of course, very true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, after all, I mean, gold is just gold is just like a shiny metal. It's not particularly good. Like, there's there's other metals that do all of the thing that gold does better, but gold's very shiny and rare. So, um, you know, here we are. <laughs> and they all I, you know, I was I wanted to say I was looking closely at that intrinsic value chart. If you if you scroll down a little bit from here, um, it, it it'll, it'll kind of show you that. Um, and I noticed it reminded me a lot of the Puel multiple. Scroll down more. Okay, sorry. Um, did this open up in a new? Uh, I guess I go back. Okay. Oh, this Press one right two. here. Uh, no. Bitcoin and gold. Uh, wait, hold on. I, wait, let me wait for the TV to catch up. No. Uh, I believe he's referring to the one described as figure 14, and then there's figure 15. One's figure 14, Bitcoin market price and intrinsic value, and then the second one's figure 15, ratio of Bitcoin market price to intrinsic value. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Which one did you want, 14 or 15, Alex? Um, let's scroll down more. I'm there, sorry. Right, right, um, right there, the, I believe figure 15 right there. So the ratio of Bitcoin market price to intrinsic value, that's essentially the Puel multiple, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, because you've got the cost to produce by, you know, cost to sell. Yeah. yeah. And interestingly so, enough, we talked about this before. Uh, let's actually go over to Glassnode and look at the Puel multiple today. Yeah, so this is essentially, they're looking at it from like, they're looking at it from the demand side of supply and demand, but the Puel multiple is looking at it from the supply side of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. And yet we are certainly in the accumulation area. So, you know, if this, I mean, if this isn't screaming a movement to 18,000, you know, over the next year, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what, what possibly could, you know. Your mother. We could totally make a... I think we could totally make an assault on, you know, 18,000 by the end of the year and just consolidate up in that area. And then finally, you know, break resistance sometime yeah. in 2021. Make everyone feel like they're standing on a plank. Just consolidate up there for a little bit. Everyone's like, nope, we're dropping. Nope, we're going to the moon. That'll be fun. We could talk about, uh, I mean, you know, kind of the three that I, that, I, that I glossed over a little bit is, you know, Coinbase acquired Tagomi. Uh, Samsung is going to offer the ability to integrate with Gemini and is it Coinbase? Hold on, hold on. I was just, it, it would surprise me if it wasn't Coinbase. It's Gemini. It's Gemini. Samsung's blockchain wallet will add support for users of uh, the exchange Gemini. 
Uh, Mike Novogratz terrified of uh, Chinese CBDC. Russia bans and you know, we. I always we could poke some fun at BCH if you guys want. <laughs> BCH uh, punch just, bag hour. It feels just kind of like beating a dead horse. <laughs> You know, what we can talk about is uh, Wall Street seems to have uh, a lot of renewed optimism right now. I noticed, uh, you know, the Dow earlier this week, you know, had to put in a big 500 point day. Um, you know, things that, and now with the, you know, the you know, things in bloom right now, summer afoot, uh, is it the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the COVID thing kind of seemingly blowing over, uh, you know, it's like that renewed optimism is certainly, you know, going through, running through the markets right now. I don't know if it's snagging retail and if, you know, in, institutional big players are still very weary, you know, is this a, is this an opportunity to like, you know, to get out at another top for, for Wall Street? Or, you know, are things generally turning around and this whole thing was a big buying opportunity? I, I, I'm not too sure if... Uh, I if feel like the markets... That. I feel like the markets are, are... I mean, we know the markets are being pumped up. I feel like the reason the markets are being pumped up is so that institutions can make a graceful exit and dump all of these bullshit, highly overpriced assets onto the heads of retail traders. We know retail traders have been... Uh, have been just rushing into the markets recently buying you know companies that are on the verge of bankruptcy because the prices are low you know just the very definition of dumb money stuff that happens on the markets uh you know i i i read recently and i i don't remember where i don't know if you can search this or not that some institutions are some hedge funds are starting to take their money out of the market because they're just it's they're just like i mean yes the price is going up but it's completely divorced from from good news from bad news from you know anything that's going on in the wider economy how how do you how do you as an institution make solid uh make solid investments in the future when the market is just divorced from reality it's like okay let's just take our money off the table because it's impossible to have any confidence in any of the choices that we're making here so i i guess i guess where where i am with the markets as a whole is it's just i mean it's insane i i mean fine uh you know maybe things haven't been as bad with uh you know COVID-19 as as we thought it's going to be but I mean regardless the response you know has been really bad for the economy you know like what, something like 20 percent is unemployed and it just I, I think it speaks volumes that we haven't even seen like a we haven't even seen a dip since March really I mean I guess we've seen like a you can barely call those retracements. I don't, I don't know what you call them. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop, and I'm thinking that's yeah. the institutions are as well. And that's kind yeah. of what I was, I've was. i been saying for a long time, is that this, like, even if you go back and look at, like, the first one that happened in 1928, or it was 28 into 29, because the first dip wasn't what actually caused the depression. It was the second one. And the second, the first one when it dipped and it got back, bought back up it was all the big money throwing it back in to try to get confidence back of course and like i feel like this is the same like grace period to where we're just hyper inflating the shit out of it where it 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 doesn't seem logical it's like not even like alex was saying like this is going to be inflated up to where they can get their exits and then it's just going to be dumped on the middle class i think this is going to be i think we're going to go through another round of it i really do yeah, all the junk bonds have been sold to taxpayers. All the all the overinflated stocks have been sold to retail traders. All like it's just like like the institutions are getting out of the market, and like yeah, that that's that's how I feel. That's what I feel is what's going on behind. I, the I scenes. feel it's unsustainable, and they know it. And this is the first time that this has ever happened in history to where there was a solid option besides just gold and silver. I think, uh, you know, keep in mind, we're also heading into an election this year, right? I think the the COVID thing, like we would probably already be in full uh, campaign yeah, swing, for sure. right? If it for wasn't sure. for, the, for the lockdown. And uh, it, maybe it's... Uh, He's talking yeah, about yeah. Trump's been campaigning for four years. I mean, he literally, he never dissolved his campaign committee. I mean, he's like still been campaigning the entire time. 
uh you know the cycle like you know usually things were gearing would be gearing up heavily by the um you know by the super tuesday and everything and like i think there's no doubt that the, the COVID thing has really put a damper on it that and of course uh, maybe a weak democratic candidate but with that said um uh i think you know maybe the the, the big the way the market is gonna play out may very well depend on the election and it might might you know might be the this any brash decisions that might be held over right it might be like the whole 08 crisis um i feel like you know, it's think... gonna work its way into being part of the news anyways so like whatever the market does people are just gonna say oh it was because of the election you know look at the 08 uh crash though wasn't that like uh like just as like obama was transitioning into the white house wasn't that like immediately following his election no, it was like... immediately before if i recall correctly george w bush had started the right. bailout a little bit and then obama came in and basically just said well let's keep doing these things they seem to be working and they continue right. to work um it, well it kind of occurred in, in transition between the two administrations right so yes, you wouldn't yes. be surprised if something similar you know like if, if if whatever power trump holds and sway over in the treasury or in the fed you know they, they might want to you know pave over the problem in the interim right and well, you know, know how, how might come like to, you know they run the economy into the ground and then a democrat comes into office and then suddenly the economy craters because yeah so i mean it, it it fucking happens every political cycle and um you know if i wouldn't be surprised to see it again here you know here we are uh we yeah so what you're yeah, saying what I you're saying that. is if biden gets elected so 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 yeah i mean yeah it's i wouldn't wouldn't you if your company it's like uh-huh you know do we want more money in the market when there is someone literally printing money and handing it to us do we want less or, or or when someone isn't doing that well obviously you know it's uh it's what's the term uh it's you know perverse uh perverse incentives either way i mean trump uh trump looks like the incumbent win here and uh so if, if that's your sentiment yeah. then we might be in for a you know rip roar another four years especially if this turns into a giant rebound and like uh you know a cocaine fueled you know after party for the next roaring 20s part Street. two guys Ooh, roaring 20s Send it. You know, it could, uh, this whole, you know, yeah, it could all be built on Fed money printing, but maybe it'll be a springboard into a, a really bullish another four years that might catch everyone by surprise. But, you know, I, at the same time, I'm I'm very cynical, I think. In that the, is, I was going to say, we that's have a strange bit of coming COVID from yet. you. I've never heard Jack be so positive. <laughs> I, I'm the one. To, I don't want to deny the mag, the m money printing magic that goes on at the Fed. I think if like they can defy gravity now, uh, you know, like if the markets are already like Nasdaq's doing what it's doing today, for instance, like if they can do that, they can probably print their way into like another four years or another decade or even another generation worth of prosperity. Uh, so I don't. I don't want to like, discount their their ability. But end of the day, you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm long Bitcoin. I'm bullish Bitcoin. I think no matter what they do, we might be might have a good few years. Of us. Yeah, I mean, so there's a couple there's a couple options to this argument. So on one hand, you have what I would consider there, you know, what's interesting right now about the market is that the classic argument for the stock market is a bullish argument, right? Because, and I, you know, I have the I have the monthly chart of the SPY pulled up, and you know, I can go back and grab more historical data. But this is just from '93. Um, you can go back, you know, you can just look at the overall asset equity market going back to like you know the early 1900s, and you can see a a, a consistent and persistent upwards trend in spite of all things, all market calamities, all market panics. They eventually get bought bought, bought back up, and major indices continue to work. So we just pull up the SPX. In fact, you know, let's just pull up the SPX. So here's the uh, here, here's the S S here's the actual indice, right? This is from TVC, but this one goes back to like 1970, right? It's a clear upwards trend, right? In spite of war, calamity, fa uh, you know, uh, famine, plague, Democrats, conservatives, libertarians, Ross Perot, doesn't really matter. Like markets just continue to trudge upwards. So you know, the traditional wisdom has been a buy and hold strategy. You know, buy dips, uh, sit through drawdown, and just have faith as a long-term investor. And eventually, at some point, you'll be able to cash out at a higher price. And if you're getting close to retirement, then p potentially you could consider some more advanced strategies like hedging. 
And that's been the narrative as long as I've been alive in my and in all my experience in the financial industry. But a new narrative has emerged over the last decade that the stock market is poisoned, that assets are toxic. And based on, you know, and this is essentially a lot of the arguments that, you know, that we make in the Bitcoin community. And this argument has really, uh, that argument has been in the background, but become more mainstream and popular. Obviously, Occupy Wall Street brought this to light. The 2008 financial crisis brought this to light. The housing market crashed, the bubble. This all, you know, kind of came to light. It's become a more popular theory. And it's been a theory that's been hard to hold on to in the face of a roaring bull market, which we have seen since the, the, the 09 recovery. However, in my opinion, the new normal that almost seems to be tipping the scale of the old normal argument, like the argument that you just hear roll off of people's tongues as this is the way that reality is, this is the way life is, these are facts, not opinions, is that essentially what I've heard, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, the points in this argument that, you know, this is a artificial pump, that this is not based on reality, that the market is imminently going to crash, that we're going to go down, that you know, everybody's going to die, dogs and cats sleeping together, absolute pandemonium. So we could look at this chart a couple of ways, right? If we're looking for an analysis and understanding of this chart, either understanding one is that, hey, look, you know, this is the classical argument. This is the bullish argument. Like, look, guys, you say all you want, but America is the strongest economy in the world. Uh, we have the sovereign current. We have the reserve currency of the world and we get to print it. So that creates a lot of problems, but it is what it is. And our monkey is sitting pretty well up on their on their unicycle to the best of their ability. Uh, we had a big sell off because of this pandemic. But look how quickly we've recovered. And the reason that we're going to continue recovering and continue moving up is because now we've kind of figured out that, hey, COVID was bad. But, you know, we've, we've got it, you know, kind of figured out and we've got some plans in place. And we're going to be coming off of lockdown and people can go get back to work. So just like 08, it really took two years to recover from, you know, 2019, it's going to take a couple years to recover from, and then we're just back off to the races. And this, you know, people say that the stock market is divorced from reality. Well, the point of the stock market is to price future sent is to, is to price sentiment about the future into the value of an asset. So if after the dip, uh, the majority of institutions, the majority of individuals with money felt that way, that, hey, uh, you know, this is a damn good buying opportunity and we're going to figure out this virus stuff. We're going to figure out this pandemic stuff. This isn't the end of the world. And America was strong before. That is literally the the function of the stock market is to take that bullish optimism and and utilize that uh, as uh, as a price discovery mechanism for what the actual value of a share is. So that's that's the common argument. That's the old classical argument. The second classical argument is that, you know, hey, the, the market is completely divorced from reality, which I would say is not completely true. Like the the the, the share price of the market is sentiment priced in uh, with other aspects like fundamental analysis, stock to flow ratio, cash flow. Um, but I don't have a strong opinion on this, right? Uh, you know, as a technical, you know, as a technical trader, I think. Uh, so I don't want to discount um, anything that was said here because there is, of course. Uh, this is why I support this is why I support Bitcoin. But see, I'm in an interesting position as an investor, right? Where I am in the equity markets. I have bought throughout this dip. I have added to positions throughout this dip. I haven't sold off my investments. I shorted the market via a trade, a very large trade, actually. Um, and uh with SDS and an SH, and that was a very profitable trade for me, and that allowed me to hedge a lot of this drawdown. Um, and if I get the kind of technical sign to do that again, then I'll, I'll do so again. That's really the first time I've ever done such a thing because I didn't start investing until after the 08 crash. So I've never really experienced a massive market crash like this. Um, if I were to give any advice to individuals, it would have to be this, uh, because I don't know what's going to happen in the future. My, my advice, you know, and as a trader, I rely on my active income and that gives me, that gives me a lot of freedom. So my, my first initial advice would be. Don't just rely on passive investment, learn to trade and take a more active position with your portfolio, because just as I said, right, if you don't feel that that first classic argument is valid, and this is to everybody watching, if you have money in a 401k, or if you have money with fidelity, or if you have money in a pension, okay, that money is being managed by somebody who believes lock, step and key in the first argument that I laid out and does not pay credence to the second argument, right? 
If you go to your fund manager, if you go to your investment manager and ask them to short sell the market, they will likely tell you that they you shouldn't do that. And, and furthermore, that they might not even be able to do that on your behalf, which means you do not have control over your portfolio. Just as we tell you, not your keys, not your coins. If you have all of your wealth, your retirement wealth, sitting in the hands of somebody who is a permable and you do not agree lock, step, and key with the classical bullish argument of the market. And you feel that there is some credence and some possibility in the second argument that, hey, there's a lot of shady stuff going on. The issues from 2008 were only patched over. Doesn't matter who's in office. Uh, it is, you know, the overall manipulation and toxicity of the assets that are being printed and produced. Alex, you brought up some great points. We have seen retail traders come out of the woodworks and snatch up all of these what could be potentially toxic assets. Uh, and we could potentially be see seeing investors, larger investors exit the market, hedge funds, institutions, pull their money out of the market because they know it's coming. So my approach to this is a little, uh, is I think relatively simple and, and I consider the safest thing that I can do. I have a relatively large portfolio of assets, of traditional assets. I'm going to maintain that. I'm going to continue to add to that um, because I am a patriotic American, and, and that might not have anything to do with it, but I believe in the value of the companies that I've invested in. So regardless of what the index does, regardless of what the economy does, at my age, I'm 32, I feel that over the next 40, 50 years, that the assets that I've invested to, uh, that the assets I've invested in will be valuable, right? I think that Coca-Cola is a good company. Hormel is a good company. Johnson & Johnson is a good company. 3M is a good company. McDonald's is a good company. And I don't think those things are going anywhere. So that's why I invest in stocks, right? I invest in assets, and I've got some, uh, I've got some ETF exposure. I've got some, uh, some, some uh, like you know, VTI exposure and SPY exposure and Dow exposure. But you know, I invest in individual companies, and I'm also invested in Bitcoin. So my recommendation for individuals and what I'm personally doing is treating dips as buying opportunities, as you would always classically in the market, but being smart about it a learning how to trade and having the ability to short sell or move out of your positions if you feel that's justified based on your own opinion your own analysis of the market and b by investing in alternative assets for example precious metals which i which i, I have I've been accumulating for the last six years now uh cryptocurrency which i've been accumulating for the last four years now so that's the passive approach um and i think a 50 50 split is completely valid i think a 50 50 split is completely valid uh, and again, learning to trade and just getting out there and getting your own opinion uh, is good. But I wouldn't I wouldn't feel comfortable placing my eggs 100% in either basket here because at the end of the day, we don't really know. Very well said. But it's valid. And I think that people should be more educated about this. I think that people should be researching this more because this is the future of our financial i mean this is our financial future right this is the financial future of our economy of our country of a lot of these companies of our children of our of, of our loved ones of ourselves and I think, uh, I think it's the most responsible thing you could possibly do in this time because when you think about it what are you doing when you're working and living and you're basically trying to create an environment in which you thrive and and have enough to live and what is trading doing that's exactly what it is especially in a time when people are having to be quarantined and work from home and stuff like that like you have access to this yourself why wouldn't you work towards that in these uncertain times in these did you guys you got the 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 viewers will see this like i just got looked like i had a scared look and like looked at the clock because i misread my watch i thought it was 2 15 because i have a meeting at two o'clock and i was like oh crap i've been going long on the show for an hour again darn it <laughs> no i'm totally fine yeah you guys bring up some really good points um, Beeflo just mentioned there. It's like, oh, so you don't want to bring up your Tyson short, huh? <laughs> no, we're not. We're not going to talk about that. That one, I might, I might have to, I might have to uh, get out. <laughs> what's the no? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, exit gracefully. Exit gracefully, right? I might have to exit gracefully, like uh, like Berkshire Hathaway from the, <laughs> from, from from traditional markets. Yes. Divest. Just like, gotta divest myself of the position. Just divest like, myself. Like Warren from the airline. I was invested in it. No, I'm divested. Let's go. I'm divested. It's strategic. Don't worry. We got any uh, any more Q and A? Any chart requests? 
Yes, we did. We got Wayne Arndt would like to look at ETC USD. Look at BCH Bitcoin on the weekly. That looked really interesting to me. Did you did you just ask me to look at BCH on the weekly? Yes, look you did. B yeah. Boo it's this that time. Boo it's this that time of year. <laughs> Boo this man. Ooh, it's that time of year, guys. All right. Um. So we want to look at ETC USDT. E yeah. On the daily. And okay, there we go. I just got to zoom in a little bit. All right. Let's look at. All right. Let's see what I'm gonna turn on here. <coughs> Now it's like it's winding up. It, it does look like it's winding up. It's got cool. that old wind up going on. Yeah. Uh, so this is, ETC is not really in an area where I want to trade it. Uh, but I would certainly be looking at that breakout above 707. Mm -hmm. Currently we're trading at about 680. So, uh, you know, there, you know, there's a little bit here that's kind of positive, right? You know, consistently higher lows, right? Even, you might even argue that this is like a double bottom return to the range. Um, and that we're now consolidating at previous resistance, which is always something that I like to see, forming a little bit of a higher low. So if there were a trade here on the table, I'd be looking for a reversion to the mean, but that's only about like three to 4%. I would really be looking for a big move out of Ethereum Classic on that break above 707. And I would argue that, I would argue that, uh, you know, Ethereum's uh, 2.0 launch is, is, a, is a pretty big cattle, you know, fundamental up coming up. And that's going to be a rising tide that lifts all boats. Ethereum Classic is obviously... And next to ERC20 tokens in general, you know, ETC is clearly going to benefit from that. So I don't think that you're offsides being bullish on Ethereum Classic moving forward. Uh, we just came off of a huge series of successful bottom feeder trades after a oh, yeah. long, long oh, series of, that. after a long, after like, after four series of unsuccessful bottom feeder trades. Yeah. <laughs> but bottom no, feeder was just really bullish. Cool. It was like, buy this the whole way down because we're coming back up. Um, but yeah, bottom feeder was nailing it over here. Yeah. Uh, it's actually like this one clearly worked out. Here's bottom feeder here, nailed it. Here's actually these worked out, nailed it. Uh, nah, since it double bought back here again, that probably didn't. So actually, it's only one, two losing trades. This one was a winner, and, and that series was a winner. Okay, neat. Go bottom feeder, and then obviously win, 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 win. Called that recent dip too. Um, so yeah, we're a little off sides. Let's look at, uh, let's, let's take a look at some classical right here. Daily. Uh, yeah, just kind of like right in the middle of the range. We're getting a little bit of Bollinger Band contraction. It's not really the, the best thing that I like to see. Yeah, this is kind of agreeing. You know, I'd like to see that after this little bit of contraction, I like to see that Bollinger Band breakout above 707, which would be agreeing with that 707 identically on the breaking Bitcoin system. So. Yeah, nothing, nothing to do right now. But I don't think your offside's being bullish. I don't think it's the best time to buy right now toward the upper side of the range. Uh, either accumulate at the lows or buy the breakout. Trade the breakout, actually, more correctly. Uh, what, uh, uh, you said, so this... This dude wanted to look at BCH on the weekly. US BCH Bitcoin. BCH Bitcoin. <laughs> I think I'll probably have to look at um I wish there were there could be like a day like to where trading view or someone would do it to where whenever t someone typed in BCH for that day and clicked on the chart, they got rip rolled. I mean, damn, looking at this chart, I just want to, you know, it's like, like you got, like you got Rick rolled, you know, like, you know, I remember selling my, I remember when, um, I was obviously around and pretty active during the user activated soft work. And I, I remember getting my, my crypto dividends. I remember getting my BCH and I made a steam at post about it. You guys can go check it out, right? Like the, it looked like the market capitalization of BCH was rising and the market capitalization of BTC was falling and they were making a triangle and I made an Illuminati joke. Um, and, you know, ever since then, you know, ever since they came in and, and 
put the put the chip in my brain it's, it's things haven't been the same but cool. um uh <laughs> just maybe th <laughs> just maybe think of you guys uh, you got it i don't know if you've seen bitcoin daily's new video but he's <laughs> He's like talking about, uh, he's pretending like he's Bitfinex's CEO and somebody is heckling him from the audience and he's like, take, take him out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anyways, so, uh, but anyways, I remember like BCH was right, like right around, I'm going to say it's like 1400. Let's go see. BCH was actually one of my best trades I ever accidentally did. I bought in December of that month, and then it just went on a tear. I think I'm at 2400, I think, is a, is probably, probably better where I ended up selling my BCH. I know I got off on a relative close market top. I'll have to go back and look. Um... I didn't do it on Coinbase. It's not where I sold my BCH. Um, I sold it for BTC. Um, but yeah, and I, I really, I, that's, I have never bought and held BCH since. Um, but anyways, BCH on the weekly, uh, bottom feeder signal, man. I mean, looking for at least a 17% move. And uh, I mean, we're at the lows. We're at the BCH well, also, lows. Um, also, so throw in a time transformation uh, over a toll that. signal. Well, those other those other ones look like they were good. Yeah, pull out time transform. Yep. Well, what I meant by accidentally uh, doing something good when I was trading, it was before I was even using a system. I was going off my gut and everything. So I... You got I you, you, you got telling you to buy BCH? Well, no, it was before I was part of this group. It was like one of the best trades I ever had was I bought it in that December of when it was way down and it went on just a tear. Because I thought it was a little undervalued for the moment. I don't really look at the coins like a lot of people do, like on the projects and stuff like that. A few of them I do, but I, yeah, I mean, focus on Bitcoin. Think about it. If there was an alt season, do you think Roger Ver would miss the chance to pump BCH? Right. No, dude. He's not going to miss this chance. I'm telling you, now's the time. Look at this. Look at it. Look at this. Look at that. It's telling you. Look at this. <laughs> look at it. Come on, what more do you need? See, are we gonna are we gonna respect the uh, the lower low on this pump for your stop loss? No, like looking at a target around like you know thirty six or you know hundred sixty thousand sats. It'd be a uh, forty percent trade. Yeah, respectable. I got a bet for forty percent. Shit, most people get out of bed for negative. <laughs> yeah, I mean, say what you will about BCH or even BSV. Like these are um, still top ten cryptos by by market cap, right? They still mm -hmm. have a pretty, you know, important position in, uh, in the great scheme of things. And um, any word of a uh, well, so basically any any kind of bullish action, you know, any altcoin season, obviously, will, these coins will probably perform well. And uh, um. Even uh, I think I lost my train of thought on this one, but um, people have been sleeping on the major alts right now. If you, uh, yeah, the major alts just like they've been holding up next to the mid cap and the and the shakuns. Oh yeah, of course the the fork potential fork of BCH, right? Uh, you know, if you're Some looking for BCH dividends, I think Perfect. you know, I think you know, it used to be that people would when they heard that there was going to be a fork they'd be like oh i'm gonna get extra coins and that would be bullish news kind of for the price bullish. at least for the coin but these days man if if i heard bch was forking i think like oh great they're gonna have even less hash rate to go around it's already cost like what a hundred dollars an hour to hack bch right now at this point 
Totally. But with that said, like, you know, uh, I agree, maybe not, not doesn't carry the same glamour as it did before, but nonetheless, yeah. uh, you know, like a lot of times I think these things are, are waiting to either pump or dump and it just needs the right excuse to go with it. So, you know, we, we may, you. you know, in the next few months, we may very well be in the midst of an alt season and, you know, B BCH's big breakout might coincide with uh, whispers of a, of a fork incoming, right? So, uh, you know, these are the kind of the narratives that build and drive these hype cycles, right, of speculative yeah, assets. Definitely. Well, you know, I'm a speculator. I just, if there's going to be a change in price, I want in. I want in. Justin, could we take a look at GDXJ for Caprica? Sure. I, I wanted to look at that. Uh... Oh, what did I? I got like all the way over here. Um, I should not be on this chart. Uh, but the BCH USD <laughs> kind of suggests that. Um, no, because I did it in the wrong window. Uh, this is my window set up for the 45 minute. Yeah, and then uh, that and that's it. Uh, we we gotta get we gotta go because I need to grab some lunch before my meeting. All right. Um, let's go. What was it? Um, B GD A G D Q. G D X J. All right. Let's take a gander here. Um, okay, so, I mean, first things first. Obviously, we're in a bullish trend. Uh, all right, so this would potentially be hinting at an early exit. Um, yeah. I don't really know if... I would want to see that actually closing complete because you know parallax just flipped bullish we just broke above some resistance that was a that was a weekly gravestone though oh we are on the weekly aren't we yeah you you do bring up a good point you do bring up a good point so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be insane to see that it's even a it's even a, a haikanashi doji as well yeah yeah And then, then, you know, it's, it's clear, like, looking that's a, at that's a, that's a pretty, that's a pretty long-term, you know, horizontal as well. Agreed. I mean, that's a level going back to 2013. We've just been unable to break above this range. Yeah, I don't think that, yeah, especially looking at that weekly sell potential. I mean, we've got some, it's not too, it's not too long for the end of the week though, for this anyways. Um, on the daily, bottom feeder would be suggesting a moving up to 46.94. I think bottom feeder is a little too active on this as it is on most. Uh, you know what? It's probably not too bad, actually. Nails it here, nails it here, nails it here, nails... Actually, I'd say bottom feeder is pretty damn good on this. <laughs> um, so maybe a move up to 46.94, potential to exit gracefully. Looking at that weekly chart doesn't really inspire me with confidence. I think Alex, you have this right. Uh, what, what? I'm sorry, I'm just laughing at you know, like you know, I didn't we didn't even make bottom feeder for this, and it just it just kind of kills. I'm just kind of laughing. Um, on the daily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the daily is bearish too, man. Yeah, yeah we, uh, I agree. We, we, we just we broke the the initiator to the downside. Anyways, we're bearish below 48.06. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this wouldn't even be something. Parallax is bearish on the daily. Minx is bearish on the daily. Wa uh, hell, Wada Tar Explosion is bearish on the daily. Smoothed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think that All weekly right. is pretty right. telling. You might see a. You might see. We might actually see a pretty big pullback coming on the weekly, unless we get some really bullish action and break out above resistance since 2013. Sell it. All right. Um, hey, guys, thank you so much for coming on. Great conversation today. Any thoughts before you guys go? Bye, Bitcoin. Bye, Bitcoin. Bye, Bitcoin every day. I think that um, for the, the rest of the day, what you can expect for... Um, 
price movement i think that will likely get i mean if it holds here and presses up into the higher nine thousands that i could see that but i could also see it dipping back down to that 9300 like alex talked about and then uh pressing on up into that higher nine but i do believe we'll get a one leg up before we ultimately reject awesome good stuff guys thank you so much for coming on i'll see you tomorrow have a good one see you tomorrow Bye, guys. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining me for another episode of Breaking Bitcoin Market Analysis. Of course, today was brought to you. Today's show was brought to you by the Cracking Cryptocurrency Premium Trading Group. If you're tired of trading or watching price from the sidelines, trading with your gut or being disappointed by Telegram, never been a better time to join our community, work with our mentors and begin building your own trading strategy, taking advantage of all that we offer. Link is in the description down below, uh, or you can visit premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. We appreciate all the support, and I'm really excited about the new products that we're going to be pushing out over the next few months. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, sarcastic remarks, or death threats, make sure to drop them in the comment section down below. We'll try to respond as quickly as possible. And of course, make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, that way you can be notified when we go live. Uh, let's try to get the likes up to 50. It does really help us out. Thank you guys so much. And if you're watching on uh, Twitch or DLive, you can, of course, support us with a follow or a subscription. Otherwise, looking forward to talking to you guys in the Discord. It's free for everybody to join. Discord.crackingcryptocurrency.com. Link for that is in the description as well. Big shout out to Senior Analyst Alex, Junior Analyst Jason, and of course, Crypto Jack for coming on the show as always, we will be back tomorrow at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time for another episode of Breaking Bitcoin. Until then, guys, trade safely.